very short introduction. Uh, as you know, this is not the first, as some of you know, this is not the first uh, half-baked uh, series. This is the second, and I'm very pleased to introduce the first colloquium of this 2021 series organized by Culinary Minds. Uh, that is a, a center for the philosophy of food uh, who, uh, that aims to promote uh, a very interdisciplinary perspective on food. And this colloquia, the half-baked colloquia, were specifically meant to be original conversation among young scholars working on food from different philosophical perspectives. So our first guest is uh, Matteo Ravasio. Uh, actually, he's postdoctoral fellow at Peking University in Beijing. He works in the philosophy of art and aesthetics, but also philosophy of religion and ethics. And he wrote recently about food landscape and his talk today will be a hedonic and normative principle in food appreciation. As I said, we are recording. The, the talk will last uh, about 40, 45 minutes, and then we can have a very little break and uh, the Q&A and the discussion later. So I leave you the floor, the screen, Matteo, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Beatrice. And, um, and of course, thanks uh, to all of the organizers for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be presenting uh, a paper for this uh, series. In fact, the title, I was joking earlier, it's mostly appropriate, half-baked. And in some sense, uh, this paper has a paradoxical feature of being both uh, half-baked and overcooked in the sense that it's half-baked because it's partly in progress, but uh, overcooked because uh, in a way, um, the, the starting idea was something I was, um, thinking about a few few years ago, two, three years, three, four years ago, and then I thought it was superseded basically by, by this paper, this excellent paper by Matthew Stroll, probably um, you, you know this already. I think in some sense it did a certain things that I wanted to do um, uh, much better than I thought I could. So um, I, I abandoned that project for a while and now I try to sort of bring it back and, and see what I can do with it. And the, the topic as you, um, might have um, guessed looking at the title, is um, a reflection on the role of gustatory pleasure in our appreciation, aesthetic appreciation of food. So I thought we, we could start with this uh, rather famous quote uh, by Paul Bocuse, uh, who said, classique ou moderne, il n'y a qu'une seule cuisine, la bonne. Classical or modern, there is only one, one cuisine, the good one. And I take it that um, by uh, the good one, uh, La Bonne, it could have meant, of course, the accomplished one, though that would have been, uh, uh, that's probably not what it's meant. What it's meant is the, you know, the, the one that tastes good, the, the one that tastes good. So it's a principle that is meant to capture that um, uh, concerns for a gustatory pleasure, the pleasure of the palate are central in our aesthetic engagement with food. It seems, you know, an obvious enough thing to say. Uh, so the idea is to test exactly um, what the claim means, um, so in how far we can go in terms of a description of the aesthetic appreciation of food in terms of um, an appreciation of the gustatory pleasure that is provided by the food, food stuff. So um, my topic is gustatory pleasure and I want to distinguish it um, quickly from a different kind of pleasure that is involved in eating, which is, uh, we could call it the pleasure of satiation. So um, when, you, when you eat, typically you are at least a, a little bit hungry and uh, you get the feeling of getting rid of the feeling of hunger and that normally feels good. It, it feels good. So it, it's got this in common with gustatory pleasure that, you know, that both pleasures are, um, both, both sensations are, you know, are pleasurable. They are positively valenced, uh, but they are different sensations. So, um, yeah, they occur at the same time because, again, most times when, when we eat, we are also a little bit hungry, um, um, and also they sometimes interact. So, typically, if we are a little bit hungry, uh, our sensation of pleasure is is in, is, is increased. So, our sensation of gas or pleasure is increased. People say uh, hunger is the best source. Perhaps extreme hunger is going to dramatically increase our sensation of gustatory pleasure. 
But again, despite the interaction, they remain distinct. So I can be fully satiated and still, um, still enjoy in the gustatory pleasure sense uh, the, the slice of cheesecake or, or, or at least a little bite of it. Um, so again, the, the focus of the paper is of course the, the former type of pleasure, gustatory pleasure. So what's the role of this in the appreciation of food? How central is it? And I think there are um, first um, um, some, some intuitive considerations. Um, um, there are very good reasons to think that the role must be a very central one, especially when we confront it, when we compare the case of uh, aesthetic appreciation of food to other aesthetic contexts, and especially when compared to appreciation of, of the arts. Um, so sensory pleasure seems to play a particularly prominent role in the appreciation of food compared to what it does in the other arts. So other, of course, is uh, in brackets because um, you might think that there are culinary arts that are arts just like the other arts or not, but you, know, you, you can choose your position on that. Um, at any rate, the point here is that um, uh, gustatory pleasure is uh, sensory pleasure, and specifically gustatory pleasure, um, is central to the appreciation of food, whereas sensory pleasure plays a very limited role in some of the arts and a not so central or, uh, role in some other of the arts. I mean, think of literature, for instance, um, especially uh, if it's not read out loud, we, we don't typically say that sensory pleasure is involved centrally in it. It's more like sort of intellectual gratification or, or pleasure, if you want to call it like that. Um, but also, if you think of painting, you may uh, talk of pleasurable visual sensations, but there's certainly a lot of conceptual um, that is um, um, involved um, in addition to and perhaps more prominently than the, the sensory. Um, or again, consider conceptual art and so on. So a lot of, a lot of appreciation that is not, um, that doesn't involve sensory pleasure, contrary to what happens in the case of food. Um, secondly, and, and relatedly, what we have in the other arts is a situation in which, in most cases, expressive, representational, and symbolic properties play a, a relatively large role in, in, in terms of being the focus of our aesthetic attention. Whereas, um, in um, in the case of the aesthetic appreciation of food, it is controversial that uh, that these are, these properties are, are there at all, or are they are attended at all in when we appreciate food aesthetically. Um, as far as I know, the, the, um, the earliest debate on the, uh, in, on the topic is um, um, the one between uh, Telfer and Elizabeth Telfer and Carolyn Korsmeyer. And Korsmeyer in her classic um, Making Sense of Taste replies to, to Telfer, uh, who has a much more um, sort of non-cognitive account of, of food as an object of aesthetic appreciation. And Korsmeyer claims this account is mistaken. We have to supplement that. Um, we have to recognize the cognitive um, uh, potential of food so that in fact food is able to have as passive and representational properties and so on. And I tend to agree with Korsmeyer, with Korsmeyer's view, but I think you can agree with that view and still think that compared to other um, appreciative context, particularly in the in the um, so-called fine arts, um, these properties play a much more marginal role, whereas pleasure plays plays a far greater, more important role. And finally, um, reflecting on our experiences, we you know we make aesthetic choices when when cooking. Well, we do this all the time. Uh, now, granted, we don't only make aesthetic choices when we cook. Most of the choices um, we make when we cook cook are dictated by other considerations, financial considerations, sustainability consideration, ethical consideration more broadly, and of course, nutritional or health concerns and so on. But I think when we make aesthetic choices while cooking, gustatory pleasure is really the likely motivation behind them. We don't, we don't make, you know, we don't tweak our recipes or make this and add that because we want to, you know, change the expressive or representational properties of what we are cooking. We just want it to make taste better. So these are plausible initial considerations in favor of the idea that really gustatory pleasure is central in uh, sensory pleasure is central to um, the aesthetic appreciation of food in a way that it is in, in other um, cases in the appreciation, uh, aesthetic appreciation of other objects. So um, I plan to um, 
explore further this picture and show how in its limitation in a sense by drawing this distinction between hedonic and and normative principles. So I start from hedonic principles. We have just been talking about the importance of gustatory pleasure in, uh, in, uh, in the aesthetic appreciation of food. Um, I think that, um, precisely because we, we care so much about gustatory pleasure, we often have these sort of more or less explicit guidelines that help us maximize, maximize it. We, we know what we like, basically. Um, and I call these, these guidelines hedonic principles. And I'm going to say something more in a moment about um, the way they work and the way they, they, they function, what they are. Um, so um, the principles vary along, of course, with the hedonic preferences that they track. And some are very idiosyncratic and personal. For instance, I, I cannot, I'm not allergic to tomatoes, but I cannot eat raw tomatoes. I really find them disgusting. To me, it's the most disgusting food there is. It's just quite uh, paradoxical, maybe for an Italian, but you know, I don't, I cannot, I don't do, I cannot do anything about it. You know, I tried, but so this is very idiosyncratic, um, hedonic preference. Some are more shared. I mean, there are things that groups of people like or dislike. Uh, so these are um, how Americans order the steak, at least according to the survey, most people like uh, medium. So there is some kind of agreement at the group level. So something more about hedonic principles. Um, we could say that hedonic principles are identified by a certain type, a certain uh, imperative content. For instance, if you look at the previous um, um, survey, the one about the degree of doneness for, for stakes, um, that, um, sorry, um, that 30, um, what was that? 37% of the people there, um, um, go by the principle, cook a steak to medium rare. Um, but, um, but imperative content is not enough to determine the um, um, hedonic principles, principle because uh, what we need more is um, the intended goal. So the goal is the um, improvement or maximization of gustatory pleasure. Um, why? Because we could have the same imperative content and different motivation, and we wouldn't be talking about uh, hedonic principle, but some other you know, principle of some other sort determined by uh, which principle would be determined, um, which principle exactly would be, would, would be determined by the different sort of motivation that is involved. So take a look at this um, other survey, for instance, um, the degree of doneness of hamburgers. Um, so there is an um, agreement um, you know, there is a, there is a, um, a shared preference for uh, well done hamburgers, um, again, in the American public. Um, it could be that this is a, um, that, you know, cook a burger to well done is a hedonic principle if the imperative is paired with an intending, go an intended goal that is um, a hedonic goal, so the maximization of, of gustatory pleasure. Uh, but it could also be that uh, uh, the, the reason for the, for the imperative being, being in place is um, health concern. I mean, as you know, um, ground beef is is um, is more dangerous, is more likely to cause food poisoning if it's not cooked through, as opposed to a steak. Uh, so it's it's possible uh, that uh, the motivation for that imperative is is not a you know, hedonic one, but it's rather a um, health motivation. So again, that's the structure of the principle: um, imperative content plus intended goal. So that's the first part of the picture. Um, but um, hedonic principles are not the end of the story when it comes to the aesthetic appreciation of food. Um, I take it that as sort of self-evident um, um, that uh, it's the central feature of our appreciative practice that appreciation of food is appreciation of food items. But we, we talk about dishes, uh, pekin duck or risotto, risotto le milanese and so on, but also other culinary products or preparations. So we have uh, a basil pesto or a Bordeaux wine and, and, so, on, and so on. Um, very interesting how to actually trace the distinction between these various categories, but I want, want to get into, into this. So, um, I take it that in addition to hedonic principles, what we have are also normative principles. Um, 
um, normative principles determine the properties that a food item needs to have in order to count as that particular food item. So these normative principles may be more or less explicitly stated, they may be implicit in, in the way we, in our culinary practices, in the way we cook, or we may bother to write them down. Typically we do that in cookbooks. Sometimes we have it in, in, in legislation when we protect certain recipes or when simply we want to have, we want to state what can legally be called or described as a certain kind of product. And much like hedonic principles, normative principles are identified through their imperative content plus their intended goal, where the goal is the appropriate preparation of the food item in question. I take it that really the, the recipe is the, um, the, the locus where normally you find, um, in, it's really just a cluster of normative principles that determine the properties of the, of the, of the food item that uh, the recipe is a recipe of. This is a case um, of um, uh, normative principles being um, enshrined in the law. This is a code of federal regulation from the American uh, Food and Drugs Administration. It's, um, it's legislation about what can be called peanut butter and describes a few features of the, um, of the kind of food item and you know, what can it be made of and um, fat content and other other features about um, uh, um, about the pre preparation process and so on. Um, now I think an interesting aspect to know here is that uh, both uh, hedonic, hedonic and normative principles do not only apply to the production of food but also to its consumption. So, um, so consumption I think is just you know the act of eating and savoring food. Um, there are ways we, we like to eat a particular food item, so hedonic principles of consumption, but there are also ways uh, that a food item should be eaten in order to be appreciated as the food item it is. So there are also normative principles of uh, food consumption. I think um, this aspect of um, norms in food consumption, as far as I know, is relatively overlooked as opposed to the the uh, and the extensive, somewhat extensive um, attention that has been devoted to recipes. So to the production side of, um, of um, our norms, uh, food norms. Um, but I take it that it's, it's quite important. We have an appreciative practice um, um, that um, you know, requires to engage with food items in a certain specific way to appreciate them as the food items they are. So if you bite, if you eat a burger in the way um, that is represented in this picture and then by biting the whole thing together, I take it that you are appreciating burger correctly, but um, if someone pulled the burger apart and ate the patty first and the bun later, I would take it, you know, you almost, you have, you have not really eaten the burger. You know, the, the burger was there, but you have failed to eat it. Um, So this is a little digression uh, related to this. I think that the concept of normal, normative principles of, of consumption, it's a digression because it's not related to the, to the main topic of in the role of um, gustatory pleasure, but I think it's an interesting digression. Um, <clears throat> I think the concept of normative principles of consumption can help us trace the distinction between food items and and they're what I call foodstuff kinds, or the sort of raw materials that are food, but they're not food items. So the idea is that food items are the foodstuff kinds for which some normative principles of consumption hold. And this is a, a context sensitive distinction in, in the sense that a foodstuff kind um, a, may count as a food item in one context, but as a, simply as a foodstuff kind in another. So whether it's one or the other depends on, on context. Um, so take an example, flour, we don't have normative principles of consumption that regulate how flour should be eaten, consumed in order to be appreciated as flour. We just use it to make up, to make stuff, to make food. Or take it at the opposite end of the spectrum. If you take pesto, we have ways, we have expectation as to how to consume that product. And if you don't follow them, you may still be, of course, be using pesto to cook or to do something with it, but you're not using it as pesto. You're not appreciating it as pesto anymore. Uh, some artisanal tomatoes um, 
are also an interesting example, somewhat a less clear of a case of food item than pesto, but I think a case of food item nonetheless. You might think that if you are knowledge, knowledgeable about them, if you care about tomatoes uh, in a way that I don't do, given my adonic preferences, but um, then you might think that there are ways of eating summer sand tomatoes that, are, um, that don't count as, you know, uh, as really um, appreciating the summer sour tomato anymore. So you might think that much like pesto, uh, there are um, principles of consumption that hold in the case of summer sour tomatoes. But of course, there may be cultures in which, uh, or uh, societies in which a summer sour tomato is just introduced as just any kind of tomato, and it would be much more similar to the case of flour, in which there's no there's no principle of normative principles of consumption. You just use it and make stuff with it. A uh, related um, idea is that uh, um, sometimes food items are, so I introduced this distinction between food items and, and food stuff. Food items are those for which at least one normative principle of consumption holds. Sometimes what happens is that there is a sort of regression of food item to food stuff. And I don't mean it in a negative way, I simply mean to describe what's, what's going on. So sometimes normative principles of consumption that are characteristic of a food item, they lose strength or they disappear altogether. And new ones then may appear subsequently. And I think this is particularly common or evident when, when the food item crosses cultural boundaries. So uh, you could say in these cases that um, the food item is used as a foodstuff at least until new normative principles of consumption em emerge. So as, a, as an example, I, uh, I this example of the La, uh, of the lasagna pie, which is something that uh, you can see sometimes in um, in New Zealand, I don't know if it exists somewhere else. Um, so basically, this is this is lasagna, but it's it's, it's sort of in, in you know wrapped in in puff pastry, just like a meat pie. And um, and I confess, I know that I'm gonna maybe shock the other Italians here, but I confess it's, it's I, I I really like it. I kind of like it. It's pretty pretty tasty. Um, so this is a case I would like to say when you know the really the the consumption, um, um, the normative uh, principles related to the consumption of lasagna have been sort of erased momentarily, and 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 the the what was a food item sort of um, um, regressed to the to the to the state of the food stuff, and then has been incorporated into another recipe, another you know another dish. Now the food item. Uh, so go, going back to the the topic of the paper, which is the and the role of gustatory pleasure and, and sensory pleasure in general in uh, in eating and aesthetic appreciation of food. Um, I have distinguished hedonic and normative principles, and now I wanted to say something about their um, relation, a crucial relation that. That may, uh, that may hold between them. So in some cases, following a given hedonic principle, we make it impossible to follow a normative one and vice versa. So we can say that hedonic and normative principles sometimes are standing in a relation of mutual exclusion. So take for instance, a recipe for um, chewy, sort of the chewy sort of, of chocolate chip cookies that uh, tells you that you should uh, let them rest, let them cool down before, before you enjoy them. Uh, now, I don't know if that uh, that's best characterized as a production principle, as a consumption principle. It's, it's kind of stay, it, it, it's, it kind of falls in between. Um, you, know, uh, you could think it's a consumption principle because it's about when when to eat it, how long to wait before you eat it. Or you, but at any rate, let's take it. Let's let's consider it a consumption principle. So, um, a normative principles of, of, of consumption. Um, suppose you have this. This principle, which is pretty, I, I take it is pretty straightforward. Very, very often, it's indicated in recipes. You know how long you have to let um, a certain baked good um, rest or cool down before you can uh, savor it. Um, well, some people have a hedonic preference for baked goods uh, straight out of the oven. So as soon as they are, you know, mm, as soon as they won't uh, burn you, mm, they they like to eat them. Uh, so here we have a case of clash between hedonic pre hedonic preferences. The one, the preference for eating baked goods as, as, as when they are still warm, and 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 the normative principle of consumption uh, that says that you should let the cookie cool down. Um, of course, the reason for the normative principle is that the cookie should have a particular texture, so the texture is a 
uh, is a distinctive property of the cookie, an essential property of the cookie, probably. And so that's what that's why the normative principle is there in the first place. So we have this relation of, of contrast between the, the two kinds of principle. Um, to take another example, this is from Stroll's paper. And I think that it, what he's describing is pretty much the same thing. Um, uh, he's talking about the green bean casserole. Uh, so I, I, I read the quote, the recipe was originally meant to be convenient for people without access to fresh products and includes canned green beans, canned cream of mushroom soup and packaged French fried onions. Many people find it repellent and I count myself among them. On the other hand, I certainly enjoy inauthentic versions of green bean casserole prepared from fresh ingredients. If I'm invited to a friend's house for Thanksgiving and I'm offered green bean casserole, I might sensibly ask, this is not authentic, is it? Uh, so what's going on here is that um, Stroll is describing the contrast between the normative principle related to the production of an authentic green bean casserole and his hedonic preference for a green bean casserole that employs uh, inauthentic ingredients, that is to say that the fresh ones. So uh, the particular, in the case, in Stroll's case, the particular uh, resolution of the conflict is um, is in favor of the hedonic principles. You know, it dislikes the authentic um, version, uh, as many other people do. Uh, of course, we have um, other cases in which we may solve the contrast in favor of the normative principle. For instance, you may dislike um, spicy mustard, but um, but you will overcome that hedonic. Um, preference for a mustard less hot dog new york style hot dog because you really want to try uh, what uh, new york style hot dog tastes like is supposed to taste like so you're going to decide in favor of the normative principle over the hedonic one uh, interesting question what are the typical contexts in which we favor the one or the other but but not a question that I will examine in much detail. Uh, what I'm interested in is that either way, the very existence of a contrast shows that there are at least two competing goals at work in the aesthetic appreciation of food. So normative principles and, um, and then hedonic goals um, that are supposed to be facilitated by, um, by the hedonic principles. But why are normative principles there in the in the first place. Um, first of all, if you do agree with with the with the course Meyer line that you know that in fact there are important uh, perhaps marginal perhaps and not always there but still relevant expressive representation of symbolic properties uh, that are typical of this or that food item, of course, disregarding normative rules threatens the availability of those, those properties. So actually, we may maximize pleasure, but something that is essential constitutive of the, of the food item we are savoring goes missing. That I think is a straightforward reason for um, uh, valuing normative principles. They, they preserve the integrity of the work we are, um, well, the food item we are appreciating. Um, secondly, I think if uh, again our aesthetic appreciation of food is is uh, centrally typically appreciation of food items and again this seems just um, a fact about the practice um, then the appreciation of food item is the appreciation of its flavor profile it's not just a, um, an appreciation of a cluster of pleasant sensations so it seems to me that really the central object of appreciation the focus of appreciation is um, a particular uh, cluster of sensory of, of sensations as, as determined by the identity of the of the food item in question, not just whatever and gives us uh, gustatory pleasure. And finally, I think um, more interestingly, uh, I think the hedonic principles are sometimes themselves related to a given food item. So, um, so the um, they are not, so to speak, free floating. They depend on the food item that we we, we, are, we are considering, we are eating at, the, at that particular moment. Um, so take, for instance, uh, blue cheese burgers. I mean, you may not object to the pairing of beef and blue cheese, but you may still find it um, just unappealing in, in the case of a burger because you just think that it's not the right type of cheese for, 
for that particular kind of preparation. Um, I think an interesting example again in uh, is again found in in Stroll's paper. In he's discussing a slightly different thing is um, because um, the the idea of the paper is um, the application of a Waltonian uh, model to to the issue of food authenticity. So he's describing how changing the appreciative changes in the appreciative category might change the aesthetic properties of a, of a, of a, of a dish. So a uh, custard without a, he writes, a custard without a crisp top layer that is perceived a creme brulee might have the negative aesthetic property of lacking texture. Whereas if the same dish is perceived as a flan, it might have the positive aesthetic property of being silky. So he's uh, framing this in, the, in terms of um, uh, negative and positive aesthetic properties, but I think the issue can be the, the matter can be easily reframed in, term, in terms of um, pleasure, gustatory pleasure. Um, um, what I mean by this um, is that um, the, the custard it describes, the, the one without the crisp top layer, um, it seems appropriate to say it, it tastes better as a plan than it would as a creme brulee. So we have um, um, hedonic preferences um, that are specific to uh, the food item that we are savoring. So, uh, so far, uh, so good in the sense of um, uh, narrowing down or rather um, focusing on uh, the sense in which the, the picture of gustatory pleasure as um, the only concern in food appreciation is um, um, it's misleading, it's, it's, mis, it's misguided. It's not, it's, not, it's not the case that uh, gustatory pleasure is the only concern and um, 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 the appreciation of food items is, um, is, an, is an important uh, part of the, of the practice. But uh, I wanna conclude with a few more considerations, um, um, a sort of reply, um, imaginary reply, that could be given by the advocate of gustatory pleasure. Because um, I think that, again, there are um, other considerations um, um, and that, we can, that we can add to, to, explore the, to explore further the role of, of gustatory pleasure. I think despite what we have said about, what I said so far about the, um, the contrast between normative and hedonic uh, principles. So um, first of all, let's go back to the two possible area resolutions to the contrast between normative and hedonic principles. So if you take the first example, it was the green bean casserole. Um, Stroll's favorite resolution was ditch the normative, go for the hedonic. Um, the other example was the New York style hot dog in which the, the putative case is, um, I don't like mustard, but I still want to try the New York style hot dog. So I go for the the mustard the version with the mustard. Uh, still, I think that the the former case is is far more common than the than the latter. I mean, we simply don't typically um, um, ignore our uh, hedonic preferences because we want to, you know, uh, um, uh, go by the normative. Um, uh, principle. We just ignore the normative principle. Um, now, um, secondly, um, I think it's it's quite um, evident that um, in most cases, hedonic and normative principles coincide in the sense that, um, if you recall, the the idea was that the structure of these um, of hedonic and normative principles uh, was um, the same in that they both were constituted by an imperative content plus a function. Um, and I think that what happens in most cases is that we have an imperative content, as, um, the same imperative content performing two different functions, one of determining, determining what the food item is like and the other um, um, having the function of increasing its capacity to produce pleasure in those who eat it, so to make the food taste good. I think that's the case, um, if you think of the case of the chocolate chip cookie, the chewy chocolate chip cookie, the, um, the normative principle related to it's, you know, the time that you should wait before you eat it, it's, um, it's normative because it, um, it determines a certain property. It's related to, you know, in, in, it is required in order to secure the possession of a certain property that, we've, that, that um, the cookie should possess, but it's also a way to make it taste good. It's also the way we want it to be to give us, um, so that we enjoy it. 
Um, and um, so this is this is what it represents is in table. You have these four principles for for uh, identified by their um, hedonic content, and um, um, most of those um, in this case, all of those that are normative also are hedonic principles. Then you may may have some sort of um, some hedonic principles that don't have a corresponding normative principle. These are these are just things that pe some people might like to do, might, might like to add to their food ways that they might like to consume it and so on. But uh, in the typical case, especially when the food item um, has sort of been created and um, uh, has been you know, maintained by that specific group, the group A in question in this in this case, um, what happens is that uh, normative and hedonic uh, principles uh, coincide in this manner. And uh, finally, um, a final consideration, um, hedonic principles drive the evolution of food items and, and, and our cooking practices um, in the sense that the, the way that recipes and in general food items evolve over time seems to be much more driven by um, hedonic um, sorry, hedonic preferences and our constantly evolving hedonic preferences, as opposed to considerations of other sort. And I think this is strikingly different uh, when we compare it to what happens in the other in the other arts or in the arts. When you think of uh, you know uh, the evolution of um, representational painting, here we have uh, how Giotto, Masaccio, and Michelangelo painted the the Christ. Um, um, there's a, you know, the, the, the stylistic evolution here is clearly dictated by, you know, changes in uh, representational focus, the, you know, what, what we care about, um, um, what we think that we should represent in addition to our ability to represent it. Um, and in general, you know, you could claim that for instance, expressive properties were also, were also relevant in the sense that for instance, we moved from a relatively inexpressive depiction of, of, of the perhaps um, willfully inexpressive depiction of the Christ in the late medieval painting and a more expressive, you know, um, um, preference for more expressive depictions later on and so on. So when you, when you describe stylistic evolution in the arts, um, um, you often can tell a story that is based on what artists wanted to do with their, you know, representational content, with the exp expressive content, what they were creating, and so on. It's much harder to do that in the case of food. Now, um, a, a note is uh, the claim that I'm making is when the evolution of food items and cooking practices is aesthetically motivated, then it is motivated typically by changes in hedonic principles. It, the, the claim is not that the evolution of food items is typically motivated by changes in hedonic principles. Because of course, uh, food items change for all sorts of reasons. Um, um, you know, um, ethical considerations, um, sustainability considerations, you know, food, the, the thing is just not there, it got extinct, you know, we cannot eat it anymore. Um, so, but when, uh, the idea is that when we actually ask those who are involved in those who make the choices, um, what's the aesthetic reason for the for the for the change? Um, then typically we're going to get something like, well, I think it tastes better, and it's going to be in relatively um, few circumstances that we're going to get something else. Um, just a final thought on because I, I don't want to go over time, and perhaps I'm going over time already, but. Um, uh, final thought on on the on this role of um, hedonic principles as a driver of um, the development of food uh, um, food items. So what I've claimed is that very often um, we will find that um, you know um, unless there are other reasons not to make that move, if we see a situation like um, in the top right in the top uh, left corner um, here uh, when we have um, um, and hedonic principle without a corresponding normative principle, it's likely that uh, we will see uh, later on a normative principle that tracks uh, that hedonic principle that corresponds to it. Um, I think this is interesting in connection to the issue of um, the identification and the preservation of uh, 
food items and the idea of food items of, as cultural heritage of a group. In this case, let's assume that, you know, that food item in question um, and all these principles, P1 to P4, refer to a particular food item. And the, this is a food item that is somehow typical of, characteristic of group A. Uh, what happens is that because of the, of the um, idiosyncratic and variable nature of hedonic principles, when we move to a different um, group, so when, when, when the food item is mm, exported to, you know, it's, it's, it's made known to a different, it you know, becomes popular um, among uh, members of a different group, let's call it group B, we will have um, presumably these normative principles, you know, also imported, but different, uh, a different hedonic situation, different hedonic scenario. And this in turn will typically motivate an, a different sort of evolution in which the normative profile of the dish um, changes correspondingly. Um, of course, there are two scenarios here possible. One, one is the one, one is the scenario you see in the in the bottom uh, right corner of the screen, um, and when in which what has happened is that the normative principles has have, have sort of uh, followed the anonic ones. The other one is um, a, a scenario that is not represented in the in on the table or on the screen is that. Um, the hedonic principles follow the normative ones. That somehow the fact that there is this, uh, you know, new thing, new normativity, somehow changes the hedonic preferences of the group. Um, it's interesting to consider um, in which circumstances the one will be more likely than the other. I take it that typically, uh, what would happen is the uh, is the scenario represented here, and I think this is going to be all the more evident in the case. Uh, I mean, in those cases in which Group A is a marginal group or is a small group, a group that cannot quite, um, you know, re represents its 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 normative principles to Group B. And normative principles are, you know, they they could come from all sort of um, considerations. Um, they might be very hard to understand or to, you know, just even get a grasp of for the cultural outsider. Um, so why is this relevant at all to um, um, cultural uh, food as cultural heritage? I think we have um, um, so I'm interested in uh, developing um, an, um, an idea of food as cultural heritage that does not um, uh, flatten food items on recipes, like you know, crystallizes them. That doesn't crystallize them in the fixed recipe. I think there's um, there's something wrong with that particular approach because they are evolving things, and we should somehow track how the how they evolve through time. Um, the point is that we need to have a picture of um, what counts as the same food item as as this thing evolves through time. And and of course the idea here is that. Um, um, what happens in the scenario that you see depicted in the on, on the screen now is that the food item has effectively branched. That it may have been at uh, at T one the same. So in the, the top the top half of the screen, it may have been the same food item item because it was characterized by the same normative principles, and then it has branched into two. But effectively, the only food item we should care about, if we are concerned with the food item, the original one, is the one we see in the bottom. Uh, left corner, as um, whereas uh, you know the one in the bottom right corner has effectively become something else entirely. So it's it's determined by a, a different set of normative principles. Um, so I am, I think I don't want to say any anything more. Uh, so one final thing I um, you so I might have seen in the abstract, I said that I wanted to say something about how normative rules of consumption somehow um, may uh, make us question the idea that uh, an account of food um, authenticity can stop at replicability. I don't know, um, I don't want to say anything much about this in the paper. We can talk about it in, in the Q&A if you are if you're interested. Um, I just don't think there's so much, um, you know, compared to when I wrote the abstract, I just don't think I have that much interest to say about that. Um, but anyway, so I, I think I will stop here. I think I've talked enough and uh, I'm looking forward to your, your feedback and questions and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Matteo. It 